Tonight's guest speaker, Sarah Ayers Rigsby, is the Southeast and Southwest Regional Director for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Sarah holds a bachelor's degree from Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, and a master's degree from the University of Bristol in the UK. She's also a certified member of the Register for Professional Archaeologists. Sarah specializes in cultural resource management and historical preservation. As a regional director for the Florida Public Archaeology Network, Sarah is responsible for designing educational programming for Florida's southernmost nine counties. That's home to half of Florida's population. Prior to starting her current role, Sarah spent 10 years working as an archaeologist throughout the United States with a regional focus on the archaeology of the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic regions. Tonight, Sarah will be teaching us about the archaeological, geological, and cultural history of the Florida Everglades. Folks, please help me welcome to the stage Sarah Ayers Rigsby. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction, Zach. And thanks to all of you for being here this evening and joining us virtually as well. Uh, those of you who are in the room, in the back row, can you all hear me clearly? All right, wonderful. Um, I know you sat in the back row so you can sneak out and maybe go to the bar early, but I promise <laughs> I'll try and keep you entertained here until, uh, until the library kicks us out later today. Uh, so my name is uh, Sarah Ayers Rigsby. I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Uh, what is that? I will explain in just a moment. Tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit first about the science of archaeology. Then I'll talk about uh, Florida's archaeology specifically and the archaeology of the Everglades. And then I'll leave uh, plenty of time for questions. And if you're too shy to ask your question in front of such a large group, I'll be available afterwards, either in here or outside, to chat a little bit more. So on that note, let's get started. So I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. What is that? We are a statewide educational organization we promote and facilitate the conservation, study, and public understanding of Florida's archaeological heritage. Our mission is tripartite. We do education and outreach. So what I'm doing tonight falls into that category. We also assist local governments. So we work with Palm Beach County Archaeology uh, and Miami-Dade other counties and cities. I'll talk a little bit about some of our work uh, in Western Palm Beach County as well. And we also assist the State Division of Historical Resources. They are all the way up in Tallahassee. We are, of course, all the way down here in Martin County. Um, so what happens is that after major weather events or when there are other significant discoveries, the state archaeologist in Tallahassee may uh, give us a call and ask us to come check something out. So if anyone recalls during Hurricane Nicole, there was some uh, archaeological material uh, on some of the beaches here in Martin County. So at the request of the state, we went with uh, local police to try and document um, that site. Uh, and on that note, if you ever are at a beach or if you're ever out and you see any kind of material, archaeological material, uh, anything that could, looks like it could be significant, the best thing to do is to leave it in place, take a picture with geographic information, so know the latitude and longitude of where you are or be able to draw it on a map and tell someone about that site, right? That's going to help us figure out if that thing that you found is part of something larger, right? So tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so archaeologists, we are looking at artifacts and things that people have made and human history. We are not looking at fossils or at dinosaurs. So I really apologize if you came tonight hoping to hear a talk about dinosaurs. Please don't leave now. Please stay and learn about what archaeologists do. Um, this is a very common misconception. Um, so dinosaurs uh, died uh, 63 million years ago. Humans have only been living here in uh, North America for uh, 15,000 to 18,000 years. So, um, so there's not uh, any kind of overlap uh, between humans and dinosaurs. 
Um, and again, please, uh, so, so again, if you're disappointed, I feel like a huge part of my job with the Florida Public Archaeology Network is disappointing six-year-olds. So I hope I didn't <laughs> disappoint you just now with this information. Um, when people think about an archaeological site, they typically picture something like this. This is a wide, open, deeply buried urban site where we have some stabilization in the back. But we'll talk a little bit about how archaeological sites look different depending on where you are. When we talk about what archaeologists dig, Archaeologists, again, are looking primarily for artifacts. So we're looking at things that have been made or modified by humans. So I have a couple of different photos here on the slide behind me. One is a columella. That's the inside of a conch shell. These, are, these were used as, uh, this is essentially your ancient drill bit. Uh, that particular picture is from the Miami Circle down in Miami, uh, the city of Miami. And then I also have this photo of the Coca-Cola bottles because I want to talk about how archaeologists analyze artifacts to learn about the past. So when you look at how Coca-Cola bottles have evolved over time, we see a few differences, right? We see differences in uh, things like material, right? So the early uh, Coca-Cola bottles are made from glass. The more modern ones are made from plastic, right? When Coca-Cola started bottling, plastic hadn't even been invented yet, right? So think about the change in technology uh, and extrapolate that to the change in global technology. Think about all the things that are possible because of pl plastic and other durable materials that were more challenging um, with glass or ceramic, right? So that's one significant change in material. We also see changes in the, uh, si the shape of the bottle, right? So that has to do both with the manufacturing process of Coca-Cola bottles and also the uh, branding. Uh, so my understanding is that one of the issue with the paper labels that you see early on is that when you would pull the bottle out of your icebox, the label would sometimes fall out. And Coca-Cola said, hey, you know, we want people to know that they're drinking a Coca-Cola and not just another type of random soda. So that's how that um, shape came about. And then we also have a change in what's inside the bottle as well, right? When we see the change uh, in that 1994 bottle on the far right, one of the major uh, technological advances in addition to the plastic is the use of high fructose corn syrup, right, versus cane sugar. This allowed manufacturers to produce more, more cheaply, right? So portion sizes change. So I always like to think about archaeologists and when we're studying material culture, think about how you would explain um, U.S. society to a friend from Germany. You know, what are some of the things that are different about American culture versus German culture? All those things uh, that are part of our culture is what archaeologists are trying to figure out about past cultures. But unlike your friend from Germany, we can't just call them up on the phone or you know, talk to them over, over Zoom. Uh, we have to try and figure it out based on this very limited information. When we think about how old artifacts and people are, I always like to use um, this little cartoon to help people. Uh, I don't want to use it just so that you feel small and insignificant in our larger geological time scale. Um, if we think about the history of the world in one hour, humans only show up in the last tenth of a second. So archaeologists are focused on this narrow, very narrow uh, time span. So if anyone is ever like, oh, my knees are creaky, I feel really old, uh, don't worry. By geological standards, you are a young thing still. <laughs> and remember, archaeologists don't dig dinosaurs. If you don't remember anything I tell you tonight about archaeology in the Everglades, I hope at least you remember this. Um, so what are archaeologists looking for? What do archaeologists dig? A lot of times we are looking through people's trash to try and tell their life story. So imagine if I was trying to tell 
um, every aspect of your life from your uh, form of government to your religion, to your diet, to your social practices, and all I had was your garbage. It's incredibly challenging. Uh, so on the left, we see our, uh, our modern garbage, and on the right, we see what is referred to as a shell midden. A uh, midden is M-I-D-D-E-N, and this is an ancient refuse pile. And just like modern refuse piles, uh, middens can really range in size, uh, form, uh, and uh, material. So we have middens that represent a really transitory area or a campsite where people were maybe only living for two or three days, all the way to extremely elaborate middens where people were living for hundreds of years, right, that might be more akin to something like a landfill. So we're looking at middens to try and learn more about human history and use of the area. And I like to think when we think about archaeologists digging garbage, it's garbage can, not garbage can't. <laughs> so from middens, I love this um, artistic uh, speculative illustration of past life ways and what life may have looked like, where we can see um, and imagine people traveling through these areas uh, here in South Florida by canoe, and we see people have erected uh, different structures uh, that are everything from little, uh, like, uh, smaller areas for more temporary activity to in the back right of the picture, you see a more elaborate structure on a larger mound. Uh, so we can learn about how people were uh, living. Um, we try and are learning, we try and learn about things like uh, status of different individuals, how individual families or groups were interacting with each other. We try and learn, again, things like what people were eating, what kind of tools people were using, and all this information can be contained within middens. I also like to always talk to people. We are still creating middens even into the present day. Um, the Atari Graveyard is a video game midden um, that was created uh, in the 1980s by Atari. They made uh, several hundred uh, too many versions of their video game and dumped it all in this uh, little landfill area in the desert. And modern archaeologists are now researching this to uh, learn more about the distant past of the 1980s. When we think about who does archaeology, I appreciate that Hollywood has done us so many favors um, by presenting archaeology as this incredible and very glamorous profession with people like Indiana Jones and Lara Croft. But when we're out in the field, archaeologists look a little bit more like this. Um, not, that, not that my friends here are not glamorous people, and I have a glamour shot of myself in the field later in this presentation, so I'll point, I'll point myself out when we get to that photo. Um, so here we see uh, some of the different environments that archaeologists are working in here in Florida as well, right? So we see um, on the left, uh, more wooded environment, and on the right, that is actually downtown. That's not the Miami Circle, but it's the site just across the river that was excavated um, back in 2014. When we talk about who does archaeology, uh, archaeology is done uh, by academics, by people based in university. Uh, when Zach very graciously introduced me and read my bio, he mentioned that I worked in cultural resource management for 10 years. Uh, that's private sector archaeology. So for anyone who is like, cultural resource management, what is that? Those are the archaeologists that go in before they build roads, bridges, gas pipelines, or uh, components of the Everglades Restoration Project and make sure that those federally funded or federally regulated projects are not going to impact archaeological sites, or if they are going to impact archaeological sites, they work with uh, state and other authorities to try and minimize the impacts of those projects. So cultural resource management is actually how about 90% of the archaeology in this country happens. So most of our information about archaeological sites here in South Florida comes from various uh, CRM projects. And then, of course, we also have different universities working down here as well. 
So where does archaeology happen? We often think of archaeology as happening in these glamorous, exotic locations like Petra or Egypt or Tikal. Um, I recall when I was studying in Ireland and I wanted to do my first field research project, I actually studied as an undergraduate classical archaeology, so Greece and Rome. I thought I would be in some sunny location on the Mediterranean, uh, and instead I was in um, this little town outside of Oxford called Marcham Frilford investigating a Roman site. It rained every single day. We were living on this farm, like we were sleeping in tents. It was terrible. So, um, so I learned that archaeology does not happen in only these glamorous locations. Archaeology happens everywhere, right? It happens right here. Anywhere there have been people living, there will be archaeological sites uh, there. So here we have a shell midden site uh, on the left. Then we have, uh, this is actually a downtown uh, Miami-Dade site. We have the old Vero site, which uh, was actually just a little bit uh, north of here. It's one of the oldest sites that has ever been documented here in Florida, which is pretty exciting to have something like that so close. Um, and it's just up in Vero Beach. That's why uh, the site is named uh, for years, it was called the old, uh, the Vero Man site, but then uh, archaeologists actually identified that it was a woman, so it should have been called the Vero Woman site. Um, and of course, once they figured out uh, that it was a woman, I think they changed the name from like uh, Vero Man to like old Vero site. Uh, they never gave her credit for, uh, for being so old and being buried in that area. So. Uh, and then on the right, uh, we have a site uh, in western Palm Beach County um, in what used to be the Everglades, and that is the Hutchinson site, and I'll talk a little bit more about that site later on. When we think about tools archaeologists use, we often picture archaeologists using tools like you see here, small like shovels, trowels, screens, but archaeologists are increasingly trying to use remote sensing to help figure out essentially what could be buried in different areas. So remote sensing technologies include um, drone, um, things like ground penetrating radar, and then uh, in the background of the screen, you see a LIDAR image. So a LIDAR, um, it's super cool. You're basically shooting lasers from planes uh, and trying to see the elevation of different type of topographic features. So that can be useful in areas that are a little more rural or where accessibility is a bit more challenging. So you may have read in the news a couple of weeks ago, there was a major reinterpretation of some of the LIDAR imagery from Eastern Ecuador in the Amazon. And again, that's a site that's challenging to get to because it's very uh, remote, but when archeologists looked at the LIDAR imagery, they saw evidence for like walls, buildings, um, and major, major cities. And LIDAR is important when we look at archaeological sites in the Everglades as well. Here are some different types of archaeologists. Uh, you can read through uh, all of them here. We have underwater archaeologists, zooarchaeologists, right? Archaeologists that are studying plant and animals. Uh, childhood archaeologists that study childhood. So you can be a specialist within the field of archaeology. And of course, archaeology is more than field work, right? We have extensive laboratory analysis, we have to write a report, we can't just say, hey, I spent six weeks digging out here, here's uh, my dream impression of some things that I found, right? We have to actually write a scientific report. And then one of the most important things uh, for people to know about archaeology is that we have the responsibility for collections storage and care in perpetuity. So for forever, so when we find artifacts, when we're out at a site, whether the site uh, is being excavated for research by a university or whether the site is being excavated because um, a bridge needs to go through that area and the site has to be removed, all of the material that archaeologists remove in terms of artifacts has to be stored in a appropriate archaeological facility forever. Um, so again, that's why I encourage you, if you ever are walking along the beach and you see an artifact, please, again, don't pick it up, because once you pick it up, you're taking care of that artifact for forever, forever. <laughs> and none of us, unfortunately, are going to live forever. 
Uh, so we also want to make sure we are sharing our information and preserving things digitally, right? So we have the ability now with uh, different types of technology to preserve sites that we're destroying. So there's a lot of really interesting work that is happening now, especially regarding uh, how climate change is impacting different sites and how to preserve those sites as they're being destroyed. So I'll move into a general discussion about what uh, Florida used to look like and Florida archeology. span so when we think about uh, Florida and when we think about the Florida we know today and the Florida from the past, it's very important to note that Florida looks very, would have looked very different to the first explorers who were coming into the area. So the oldest documented archeological site in Florida is 14,450 years old. So that site was identified um, by an archeologist up at FSU. It's on the uh, Osceola River here in the Big Bend part of Florida. Uh, and when people were coming, first coming into Florida, the global climate was significantly cooler than it is today, right? And there was less fresh water available in terms of rain. So this means that uh, there was no uh, there was no Lake Okeechobee at that time as people are first coming into Florida. There is no Everglades at this time, right? The Everglades form later. Uh, and the people who are coming through and who are exploring, they are moving through a scrubby grass land that was cooler and drier, right? So very, very different than the Florida of today. And freshwater was a very limited resource. So people were seeking uh, this, these limited resources. So we have sites in the west of Florida, uh, like Little Salt Springs, um, which is uh, just south of Tampa, uh, and Warm Mineral Springs uh, in the same area, and then uh, also hunting uh, megafauna, right? So they're hunting animals like mammoth and animals that we, of course, uh, we don't have typically in Florida today. There was this thing called a glyptodon, which is basically like a giant gerbil. Um, there was a beaver that was like four feet tall. I just think it was a crazy time to be alive in Florida. Um, and sea levels, again, because uh, the global climate is much cooler, this means more of the supply of the Earth's water is stored in large uh, ice caps at the north and south poles, right? So the north um, ice cap would have extended basically as far down south as Indiana. Um, that would have been glaciers if you picture um, Indiana as being a glacial, desolate kind of landscape instead of the green landscape it is today. Um, and as you see on this map, when we look at the, um, the deepest blue line, the 10,000 years ago line, uh, that's actually how wide Florida would have been. So Florida was essentially twice as wide as it is now because that's how, how much lower sea levels were at that time because of the cooler global climate. So this means on the west coast of Florida, uh, you would have had land extending out to that point. Uh, but on the east coast of Florida, instead of having, you know, when you go to the beach now, if you go to Chastain Beach or one of our other wonderful beaches, you can just get into the water. Um, but if you were trying to get into the ocean uh, 10,000 years ago here, in addition to it being significantly colder uh, than it is now, um, you would have been jumping down a cliff about 100 feet. So it would have been a radically different environment. So uh, as people are moving through this area, the climate then begins to change and Florida begins to uh, take on its modern climate. When we think about evidence of this very early period, one of my favorite sites to talk about is the Cutler Fossil Site. Uh, this is a site that is down in Miami-Dade County. It's on the grounds of the Deering Estate. Uh, because this time period is so long ago, we have very few archeological sites that date to this period, this uh, 7,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago or 14,000 years ago period. Um, so on the 
in the, I love telling people, so in the center picture, I just want to be clear, this site was excavated by uh, an archaeologist named Bob Carr. He's like the king of South Florida archaeology. He's done all of the archaeological work. Uh, he initially investigated the site, so that's uh, his crew documenting the site. It looks like this photo is you know, from like 1896, and it's like a gold rush photo, but this is just from, again, um, that very ancient time of the 1980s when this site is originally being excavated. Uh, and then in the, um, in the far uh, left, that's actually what the site looks like today. And then uh, just beside that photo is a uh, color photo uh, that dates, that is contemporary with the center photo, right, of that initial excavation in the 1980s. Um, in the right, we see a few stone points. So just like our Coca-Cola bottles can tell us if a uh, bottle or an archaeological site, if I found a Coca-Cola bottle from 1899 at an archaeological site, I would know that that was very different than the plastic bottle from 1994. Tools like our stone points can help give us that type of information too. So here we have, um, I believe it's a and beveled points. So these are uh, points that are typical of this very early time. So this site was dated based on the technology that was identified at the site. Um, they also had uh, things like dire wolf bones. Uh, we have uh, a lot of megafauna that are using this site um, as well. And the people who were, would have been hunting and active in this area again, would have been following these animals through this grassy uh, savanna type of environment. So we're talking today about the Everglades. Uh, so I want to see a quick uh, show of hands from the people who are physically here in this room. Um, who here has ever been to or driven through the Everglades? Raise your hand. Okay, wonderful. I think it's pretty much everyone. That's great. So you'll be prepared for, for next week's talk uh, as well. If there was anyone here who didn't raise your hand, just have a little drive uh, before you go. So my next question then, uh, so I start out easy to make sure everyone's awake and then they, they get harder. Um, so my next question is, uh, did humans modify the Everglades prior to the construction of the canal system in the 20th century? So if you think yes, raise your hands. Okay, so I see a few people raising, your hand, raising their hands. So we'll talk a little bit about how humans are actually modifying the Everglades as the Everglades themselves are forming. So humans have been modifying the Everglades with different goals throughout its existence. As we move from what uh, archeologists refer to as the Paleo-Indian period, so that was the last period we discussed where the global climate is significantly cooler, um, we move into what archeologists refer to as the Archaic period. Um, it's very important to note that in addition to not having a lot of surviving archeological sites uh, that date to this period, we also don't have um, things like historical records or any kind of oral history that date uh, to, that are able to shed a little more light um, on this period, right? So we're really uh, flying blind and trying to uh, corroborate different types of archeological evidence from very few sources. So the archaic period is when uh, Florida is getting its modern climate, essentially. So global climate is warming significantly during this time, and this change is happening pretty fast. So when we think about our map of Florida that shows the different sea levels, people who are living at the very beginning of the Archaic, so let's say you were living uh, on, the, off the, on the coast of Fort Myers or on the coast of Tampa uh, at that time, or if you were living you know, 100 miles offshore in what's now the ocean, uh, so archaeologists um, from University of North Florida have actually uh, theorized that the sea level rise was so rapid that from the time you were a child to the time you were a grandparent, you would have seen the ocean come in the length of a football field. So people are adjusting very quickly to this climate change and modifying their behavior to operate in the new environment. So the new environment is 
significantly warmer, it's wetter, right? So as uh, polar ice is melting, that is creating more moisture that is available in the environment as precipitation. So as more uh, rains and precipitation, uh, as with more precipitation, you have more rain, obviously, uh, and that forms um, Lake Okeechobee, right? So Lake Okeechobee is this shallow basin. It fills with water, um, and it then overflows and spills uh, slowly moving south into the Gulf. So people are adjusting to the creation of new landforms during this period. Um, in this speculative illustration um, behind us, we see uh, people coming in uh, on a canoe, coming in with uh, fish, coming to this tree island in the center, cooking uh, at the top of the island. Uh, we see people making nets on this side and then uh, discarding refuse on this side of the island. So archaeological fieldwork by different scholars from places like University of Miami has looked at how people are modifying uh, these tree islands and showing, demonstrating that people are using material like refuse and bringing in other material to slowly change the size of these archaeological sites uh, and to make them a little bit bigger, a little bit higher, a little bit easier to use uh, dirt, even as early as this period. Uh, which we will discuss how they found this out because it's very exciting and I love to geek out about it and I'm excited to geek out about it with all of you tonight. Um, after the Archaic period, we move into the Glades period or what archaeologists refer to as the Glades period. If you're from a different part of the country, if you're from another part of the Southeast or the Mid-Atlantic or the Midwest, this period is typically referred to as the Woodland period. Um, but because Southeast Florida is different, we have a little bit of different things going on, we refer to it as the Glades period. And here we see people actually settling on tree islands. So when I refer to tree islands, uh, you all have been to the Everglades and driven through, so you're familiar. That is uh, these raised areas you see that are dry. So they can be, uh, here's what they look like uh, from space. What I think is amazing is how many tree islands, even though we've obviously modified the Everglades quite a bit, uh, as you'll hear more about um, next week, we still have so many extant tree islands that are unexplored. And it's very important to remember that they, uh, because they are unexplored, they could have important archeological information. So every little green dot you see has the opportunity to add to our knowledge and our understanding of the past here in Florida. Oh, and here, um, as you see, this is, uh, Historically, uh, prior to the construction of the canal system, the flow of Lake Okeechobee would have spilled this way and then gone gently uh, again into the Gulf. So we have to remember that the people who were living uh, in these areas, especially in uh, like Northwest Palm Beach, Northwest, uh, Western Broward, uh, Eastern Glades and Hendry, it would not have been dry land, right? Like it is now, it would have been like you would see the Everglades with tree islands and then uh, sloughs um, between them. So we have uh, different types of tree islands. We have our fixed tree island. So that is your tree island that's something like a hardwood hammock, like an oak. We have a strand tree island and then we have our pop-up or battery tree islands. Um, and tree islands uh, on the right, you see a profile of what the environmental, uh, the different environments uh, that a tree island houses, right? So they're home to a number of different species that people are exploiting. And tree islands make life possible for animals and birds in the Everglades. So they serve as a very important function in the ecosystem. So many models in the past said that tree islands were not inhabited by humans until about 2,500 years ago, right? So that it was relatively recent that people are using and exploiting tree islands. And these, uh, for years, the dominant uh, understanding of tree island formation looked at the environmental processes behind formation, right? So we have water flow from the north, 
and then peat uh, and other windborne particulates building up from the south and differential, and um, of course other contributors like bird guano creating these tree islands uh, in, uh, in the Everglades. But that humans weren't pay playing a large part in actually creating these tree islands. So an archaeologist named Margot Schwadron, who works, uh, used to work for the National Park Service, uh, she's now working for US Fish and Wildlife out in Washington. She said, you know, everyone is thinking that humans weren't involved in creating these tree, tree islands, and humans in the past didn't have a big role in creating these sites. But I haven't seen any scientific evidence, right? It's all just an assumption that we're all making. And one of the great things about archaeology is that like any other science, you have your hypothesis uh, and then you can test it out, right? So what I love about archaeology is you can, if you have someone and you're like, you know, I think this person is wrong. Uh, you don't have to just think that in your head. You can design a whole program of study to then prove them wrong, uh, which is a wonderful uh, part of a science that I think we don't highlight enough, right? The, uh, you have the chance to prove someone wrong. Um, so Dr. Schwadron worked with other archaeologists at the National Park Service to actually test out what was going on at these tree island sites. So essentially what was happening is that uh, archaeologists who were excavating on these tree island sites were hitting uh, a calcrete layer. So the calcrete layer is formed as a uh, tree island as the uh, hardwood hammock, so as the oak or whatever the major tree is on the island, takes up uh, excess of different minerals like calcium, it will secrete the extra and this creates uh, like a calcium carbonate layer. So other archeologists who had worked in the area, um, with the exception of Bob Carr, who again wrote in a report in I think the 1970s that there could be stuff underneath this calcrete layer, a lot of the archaeologists who were working in this area would hit the calcrete layer and essentially assume that there was nothing underneath, that it was the Everglades equivalent of bedrock, right? And we would find no evidence for human use and occupation of this area. But remember, we see people moving in to the Everglades as the Everglades is forming. So there was no um, tree islands in the Everglades, right, without um, human uh, use and kind of traveling through the area. Uh, so Dr. Schwadron and her team actually tested 43 tree islands in the park. What they did was they took a, uh, what uh, you see on the left, uh, this archeologist is working with a, like a concrete saw to actually cut through the calcrete layer. So this calcrete, you can't just bust through it by hand. You need serious power tools to actually dig through it. Um, so he's chiseling through it. And at 42 of these 43 islands, they found evidence for very deep and very old black earth midden, right? So we talked a little bit about middens at the beginning and what archeologists can learn from them in terms of human use and occupation of the area. Uh, and Dr. Schwadron was able to date these through radiocarbon dating to about uh, 4680 years before present, present, right? So that's almost uh, so 5,000 years ago. And looking, this also showed some of the local fish and animal life. So when we think about contributions archaeology can make and the archaeological record can make to modern conservation efforts, one of the big contributions that archaeology can make is actually looking at the speciation of different sites in the past, right? So how many uh, different types and different varieties of different fish and bird species are we seeing at a site 300 years ago or 3,000 years ago versus today, right? So. Now when we think of tree islands, so I love that Dr. Schwadron had this theory, went out, tested it, and proved that humans have been using these sites and that there was evidence for human um, occupation on over 90% of the sites they tested. So now when we think about uh, tree island formation, I really encourage people to conceptualize it as a socio-ecological theory, right? We still have 
the same factors that we had before, where we have water flow, uh, tree island peat, windborne particulates, bird guano, um, but we also have a human component as well as people are making these areas larger and higher through dumping refuse and through living in these areas. People are also using the different uh, plant and animal species. One of my favorite plants to talk about is the uh, kunti plant. So this is a plant there. The um, root is uh, edible. It's made into a flour for bread, but you have to process the root in a very specific way for it to actually not uh, poison you. So I love to think about I love to think about the people um, in the past uh, and the indigenous communities who were able to develop that kind of system and also the brave souls of the past who are like, well, we boiled it twice and it killed Fred over there, but what if we boiled it a third time? Um, and, uh, and people are obviously using um, other plants uh, as well. So when we think about human impact, I always like to remind people that uh, humans, it's important that we not think of the Everglades as some kind of pristine natural environment where there were never any people, right? There have been people living there for thousands of years uh, and people using the area for, um, for many years as well. Uh, another thing I like to talk about, of course, is how people were getting around in the past. Um, so I just heard uh, that you all are getting a Brightline station here in Stewart. So congratulations for beating out uh, some, of your, some of your sister cities up here, like Port St. Lucie. I watched the news last night. Um, of course, people who were using the Everglades uh, 2,000 years ago, um, there, were no, uh, there were no trains, of course. There were no horses. Horses are brought later by the Spanish. People are getting around primarily on canoes. So here in the state of Florida, there are over uh, 420 documented canoes. So that is how many canoes have been located here. There are so many canoes here in Florida that uh, when I was on vacation with my family in Germany, I uh, saw in like the Museum of Bavarian History, there was this huge canoe. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, that sure looks like a Florida canoe. That's pretty amazing that they look so, uh, so similar over such a wide geographic area. And then when I went over to read the little plaque, it said, on loan from Tallahassee. So, <laughs> so we have so many canoes uh, that our canoes go on wonderful world tours so people can learn about uh, use of, of, uh, of Florida here in the past. Um, interestingly, no canoes have ever been, there are canoes from Martin County that no canoes have been documented in Palm Beach County, so still looking for those. When we think about the Seminole, the Seminole are the descendant community, right, of other groups that were living uh, in the Everglades and of other groups uh, in Florida. And this is a historic postcard. So this is a postcard illustrating the area um, after uh, obviously canals, because this is a canal, as you see here in the postcard, but you see some of the same elements uh, and people using um, sites for camping in similar ways. Uh, and it's very interesting today to talk to tribal members and talk to them about when they're going hunting and camping. You know, of course, they're using modern equipment, but some of the cultural practices in terms of like cleaning a catch or kill on one side, cooking at the top of the tree island, and then dumping the cooked refuse out on the other side uh, remain the same. So it's pretty interesting. You know, we're talking about how do we uh, look at cultural practices over thousands of years, and some of those, um, some of them remain the same, which is really fascinating. Um, I would really recommend, if you haven't been there already, to go out to the Atatiki Museum, which is uh, the Seminole uh, Tribal Museum. It's amazing, it's on the reservation. They have lots of exhibits about not only historical Seminole culture, um, but they also have really cool like art exhibits about what uh, tribal members and other um, groups are up to. Like there was a really cool exhibit on skateboard art recently, so that's a great place to go. And it's just off of uh, exit 49 on, uh, as you're driving across 75. So I really recommend people go there to learn more about the Seminole tribe. So now when we think about our question, we've talked a little bit about how people were modifying the Everglades, again, prior to 
construction of the canal system. I also want to touch just very briefly on modern gladesmen and hunters who are using the area um, historically prior to uh, or during the early sort of creation of the national park. So there is a lot, the, actually much of the Everglades is federally managed. So we have a uh, national park service, but we also have fish and wildlife and we have uh, Big Cypress uh, as well, Big Cypress National Preserve, which is national park service, but it's uh, managed a little bit differently. So uh, some of the, uh, there are certain, uh, each federal agency has different regulations about what can happen within certain geographic areas. So when we think of modern gladesmen, they are in this period of adapting to the area being managed by the federal government and kind of becoming the modern system of what we think of when we think of the Everglades today. Because I think when we go out today, we think of the Everglades as um, you know, the national park where it's really pristine, there's nothing there, it's beautiful. Um, but it's been uh, modified and changed over the years. So one of the uh, things I'd like to touch upon before we wrap up today is recent archaeological work that was conducted at the Wedgworth and Hutchison sites. So these sites are both in northwestern Palm Beach County, and they're actually in areas that are now agricultural sugarcane fields primarily. Uh, but 2,000 years ago, even uh, 200 years ago, uh, these are, were actually part of the northern Everglades. So we think of this area as very developed now, or at least you know, developed agriculturally. Uh, I promised you all there would be a glamour shot of me in the field. Uh, you see me, there I am at the far top right uh, screening, so I do do actual work sometimes. Um, and why were we at this site? Why are we digging in this agricultural field in western Palm Beach County? We're digging in here because this area used to be part of the Everglades. So some of the uh, farmers in the area had noticed there were certain areas where they were finding artifacts when they were plowing the land. So the Palm Beach County archeologist, uh, Chris Davenport, and uh, Bill Ocasio, who was working for Florida Gulf Coast University at the time, he's now with the Seminole Tribe of Florida, uh, working as a historian with them, uh, they looked at LIDAR data for this area and they were able to find what was a very small elevation change that was imperceptible to the naked eye. So if you were out in the field, you would never notice this elevation change. But on the LIDAR, they were able to see it and see the shape of this former tree island. So they put together a team of archeologists uh, that went out um, here we are uh, excavating with Florida Gulf Coast University. Um, here in the background is, uh, I'm sure many people in this room are familiar with the burning that happens in the agricultural areas. So we're out, you know, working while they're burning the sugarcane in like this field over here. Um, and then uh, we are actually excavating, as you can see, uh, the archaeologist with the FGCU hat on. She's on this very dark layer, and that is actually that... 3,000-year-old midden at the Wedgworth site. Um, and the Hutchinson site was actually identified as an archaic site, so it could be um, between 4,000 and 5,000 years old. So even though this area is being used for agricultural purposes and has been plowed over, the evidence of the existence of these sites still remains to this day and is there just below the surface. So when we think of the Everglades, it's important to think about all of the Everglades, both the part that is um, still preserved and is uh, preserved either as federal land or is still, or state parks um, or other uh, management agencies, but also about the Northern Everglades as well that has been uh, developed and drained, but still has this material. So now we've talked extensively about how people have modified the Everglades. And I hope that next week you learn even more about what is happening to try and restore that flow. Um, so please uh, come back for that. Um, I'd like to just quickly uh, advertise. Uh, next Thursday, we're having a public day in association with our student programs. So we have university students out at the Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse 
uh, and we'll be out doing technology demonstrations. We have students coming from all over the US just to learn about archaeology, and we'll be digging on site. Uh, and then we have a panel at 6 with uh, some of our staff from FPAN. And then Bob Carr, uh, king of South Florida archaeology himself, is joining us, as well as the historian for the Loxahatchee River uh, Historical Society and the Jupiter Lighthouse and Museum, Josh Liller. So um, we hope you will consider joining us for that as well. I know it's a little bit further south, but it's not too, it's too close. You know, Jupiter is still close, it's still close. Um, there is my contact information if you have any questions. Thank you all so much for listening to me uh, this evening. I really appreciate your time. I hope the next time you're out in the Everglades, you think about uh, you, your friends, everyone you know as the most recent arrivals in this area with this long-term use and occupation. So thank you so much. Um, so I'll start with some questions in the room. Does anyone have a question? Oh, yes, sorry, I saw you were the first person with your hand up. Oh, that's a great question. So he asked, what would ident I identify as an artifact? And that's a great question because we talked about everything from uh, a stone point that's 10,000 years old to an Atari that was made in the 1980s. So an artifact can be anything that was made or modified by humans. And if it is 50 years or older, it could be considered potentially historic. So where I actually see uh, some confusion is things like um, if I'm assisting with like a trash removal, people will see a bottle dump or a can dump and think, oh, these are old bottles or these are old cans and I need to get them out of here. Um, but that could actually be historic, especially if the cans are, um, have pull tabs or something like that. So, oh, yes. Absolutely, so he uh, talked a little bit about a shell, and I think one of the, um, that could potentially be historic, and I think your story kind of highlights one of the issues with the collections crisis is that if we um, remove an artifact from its context, right, so if you pick it up, it might be hard to find a place that is going to take care of it, because remember, when you pick something up and you bring it to an archeologist, you have to take care of it for forever. Um, <laughs> So that's why I always encourage people to take, um, take a picture uh, of the artifact and let an archaeologist or let a historical society know, and then they can come out and document the site. Yes, sir? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, so he's asking about an uh, a stone point or an arrowhead. So we typically call them stone points because they would have actually been attached to um, spears, um, which is pretty crazy because you wanted to stand really far back to throw things. Um, and uh, that was identified, but it was not found in context and it actually came from dredge materials. So that is something that is challenging to interpret as an archeologist because when the site is dredged, that's that initial disturbance of the site. So it's not that the stone point isn't important, um, but what is most interesting about that stone point is what it could be saying about offshore material. So then I would wonder, you know, where is this dredge material coming from? Is it a situation where you're dredging from just offshore and there could be an intact site just offshore? Or are you trucking in this material from hundreds or thousands of miles away, and then it's you know, very out of context and difficult to ascertain. 
And one of the challenges we have as archaeologists is we actually see, uh, so in the historic period, especially here in Florida, um, the middens, uh, shell mounds and shell middens, the oysters that those are built out of, created really great early historic road material. So people would go in, you know, loot, uh, loot or collect or harvest, whatever you want to say, a portion of this archaeological site and use it for roads. So we do find artifacts that are then redeposited elsewhere, but they're not in that original um, context. So then we have to tell that story, right, of how they wound up there and make sure that we mention uh, that episode of redeposition. So yeah, that was an awesome question. Thank you so much. Yes. Sarah, we'll, we'll take a question from one of our Zoom viewers. Have burial sites been found in the Everglades? And if so, what's been learned from them? So that is a great question that is uh, interesting to uh, talk about. So there are uh, burial sites uh, in the Everglades. There are both um, historical cemeteries and pre-contact cemeteries. Um, with burial sites, so as archaeologists, we always want to work with the descendant communities. So in other parts of the world um, or places uh, where you have descendant communities that are have different uh, cultural attitudes, there might be um, analysis of the remains, excavation of the burial, that type of thing. Um, here in Florida, archaeologists don't do that anymore. We want to work really closely with the Seminole and the Miccosukee to uh, document um, the location of that site. And then in a perfect world, that site would never be disturbed. But unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. So what happens is often, um, let's say a burial site is identified. If the burial site is determined to be 75 years or older, so it's the state medical examiner makes that determination. If it's older than 75 years, it goes to, uh, it falls under the jurisdiction of the state archeologist and the state archeologist will actually then um, work with the descendant communities to come up with a plan for those ancestral remains. So just like we uh, probably wouldn't want people digging up our grandmother or our grandparents, um, tribal members, my understanding is that they would prefer that those burials be undisturbed. And if it's a situation where they have been disturbed already, they'll typically work with a state archeologist to reinter uh, those ancestral remains as close as possible. So we're not really in a situation where we're looking at those burials. But yeah, that's an amazing um, and really interesting question. Yes. We actually have a, a couple of similar questions coming in from our Zoom audience about the effects of sea level rise on um, archaeology in Florida. Given the fact that during the archaic period, Florida was much wider, several folks have asked whether archaeology is currently being done underwater in Florida, looking at some of these sites that may now be covered by the sea. Yes. Oh, my God. That's such a great question. And I, it is a fascinating area of research. So not only are there different scholars who are researching this, so especially on the Gulf Coast where we have these very shallow sites, um, di so different universities in the state of Florida as well. So here in Florida, we have a Bureau of Archaeological Research. So that is a state research arm. So we have a team of four underwater archaeologists who work for the state as well. Um, and they are looking at um, some of these very old and sites that have now been submerged. So one of the interesting ways that they do that is obviously it's a huge ocean. Even the Gulf of Mexico, which is small compared to like the Pacific, is, uh, is, is quite large, right? Um, is they actually look at uh, what old uh, river channels or paleo river channels to try and figure out where that river would have been draining into the ocean uh, several uh, thousand years ago. So that is a fascinating topic of research. And it's becoming increasingly important as well, not only because it's important to learn about our past, but also with in offshore industries like oil and gas and wind. Uh, just like if you wanted to build a road or a bridge on a terrestrial site here on land, it has the potential to disturb an archeological site. Something that you build offshore could also have the potential to destroy an archeological site. 
So the more accurate information that research scientists can come up with and share with other archaeologists that can help minimize the impacts of those types of projects. So yeah, awesome question. Oh, yes, ma'am. The LIDAR? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'll try and explain it to the best of my abilities. So essentially, um, what happens with uh, LIDAR is that you are using a laser to calculate the distance to a point. But it's not just one laser at a time, it's millions of layers, lasers. And then let's imagine, so I'll talk about a deeply wooded site. So you use the equation for the speed of light to actually calculate the distance of each of those individual points. And when I say you, I mean computers and an algorithm in the computer program. I'm not sitting there with like, uh, you know, my, my TI-82 or like a pencil and paper to do the calculations. Um, and because you have so many of those points, so let's pretend that like my hand here is like the tree cover and then this part of the podium is the archeological site. So let's say we have uh, four laser beams and like three hit the top of the tree canopy and then the fourth goes all the way to the archeological site or to the archeological feature. You can essentially remove, uh, do what's called the rate of last return where you're only looking at that deepest layer of the, of the laser penetration to try and figure out that distance. But essentially it's using, it's calculating the distance to objects using lasers, which is awesome. So yeah, you're shooting lasers out of planes. So like, um, so yes, it would be like if I got to, if I was like in a helicopter with my laser pointer. Um, so it's amazing. Um, we typically do it uh, by drones. One of the most interesting projects I was able to work on uh, was in uh, coastal Ecuador. So FAU is doing a project and we were using a massive uh, LIDAR equipped drone. So the drone was probably the size of maybe about half of this podium and we're moving it all across uh, coastal Ecuador. It was right after COVID, so it was an interesting time to be doing international travel, um, but they were looking for evidence of terracing that could indicate agricultural use of the area. So that was an amazing, amazing project. So does that help, did that help explain it? Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, online. Yeah, so speaking of agriculture, uh, one of our viewers online wonders whether the transition to agriculture has made uncovering artifacts more difficult in the area that was previously the Everglades, and whether you think there are many significant archaeological sites buried by agriculture in South Florida. Oh, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful question. So with with any kind of, so even though agriculture doesn't seem as invasive as something like a parking lot um, or anything like that, I would still consider agriculture as a form of development. So uh, it is possible for archeological sites to be preserved even in spite of development. But as with all development, um, there is a risk to the archeological site. But that doesn't mean that the archeological site is destroyed. Even um, if anyone remembers the news story about Richard III, where they found him in the parking lot of the Tesco's and he was just perfectly preserved. People have been looking for him for years. Um, so just like we can have intact, so archeologists were looking at the layers um, below the ground surface. We're looking at the stratigraphy to try and figure out where in time something is coming from to actually be able to pinpoint a specific place in time. So you can have development that only disturbs maybe the upper levels of that stratigraphy or the recent past and things um, that are more deeply buried or older still remain intact. So that's a good question. Yes. Oh. Oh, that's a great question. So she's asking, um, so she's talking about uh, working at the Daring Estate and seeing the, um, the back area where you would go uh, 
leave to the area of the Cutler Fossil site is being closed. Um, so I do know that Miami-Dade County uh, did some phase two investigations in the area, so they did, but not in the Cutler Fossil site itself. So there hasn't been any, to my knowledge, there hasn't been any work done at the Cutler Fossil site since like the 1980s, 1990s. Um, as archeologists, we try not to disturb archeological sites unless there's a critical need. So it's either, so your critical need can be like, someone wants to build a gas pipeline through this site and we have to get everything out immediately because it's going to be destroyed, or your critical need can be, we have a really strong research goal and we can only uh, figure, meet that goal by destroying a small portion of this site. So we try and destroy as little as possible, but obviously when you dig something up, you can never put it back together again. So it's innately destructive. So that was an awesome question about Syrian estate. I hope you like living in northern, in up north now. Yes, she's nodding, she's nodding. Everyone loves it here. Um, yes, I saw you hand your hand up. I'm being confused by my question. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. When we were in the caves in Mariana, when we were looking up at the roof, we were seeing the seashells above us because they were sending the ocean seams all the way up there when that was formed. Oh, yes. So that's a great question. So she's asking about um, caves in Mariana where they have seashells at the top. Um, and that's because that part of Florida was submerged. But that is so, um, so people are first moving into Florida. Uh, about 14,000 years ago. So that is a very cool period globally. So the earth is very cold during that period. But uh, I think like 300,000 years ago was a very warm global period. So much of Florida was submerged, but there were no people living here at that time, um, right? Because it's so long ago, it's before um, anatomy anatomically modern humans have even emerged, much less made it all the way to North and South America. So yeah, so you're absolutely right that during that period, that area would have been submerged. So sea levels um, over the course of thousands and millions of years have fluctuated. So I think during the period you're talking about with the caves, um, oh, I'm so sad I don't have a photo to show you all in the presentation. Um, but basically, if you picture all of South Florida as totally submerged, except for like maybe a couple of little islands along the I-95 corridor, that's how different it would have been. So like that's, so, so if you're here in South Florida and you're walking around, we are all walking around the, you know, the fossilized remains of uh, millennia old dead sea creatures. That's what our bedrock is made of. So it's pretty, pretty cool. So yeah, awesome question. Um, any other, oh, yes. So one of our Zoom attendees wonders whether archaeologists ever find artifacts that no one knows how or why they were used. Oh my gosh. So that is a great question. And that I would say we are always finding artifacts and we have no idea how they were used. And we are working to try and come up with our best guess um, all the time. And there are archaeologists who, so this is not about an artifact um, itself, but about archaeological sites and the way uh, archaeological, uh, when we think about the arrangement of mounds and middens, some archaeologists take a view that some of those are ritual, so there are different astral alignments, for example. So those archaeologists lean heavily into like the spiritual component of those types of sites. Other archaeologists looking at the same site will say, oh, they like built these this way because they could, um, let's say if it's a shell midden, they could help channel fish into a certain area. And they're taking a very practical view of the site. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't go back in time to identify uh, to talk to people and interview them and say, hey, what does this mean to you? So a great example is the Wedgworth site, actually. They found, the Palm Beach County archaeologists found a picture, I found a picture, found a, um, a bone carving with a picture of a panther and like waves on it. So, you know, what does that mean? Is it a representation of the water panther? Is there some kind of other significant aspect or component to um, to that site, what is the um, spirituality? Um, we're, we're trying to figure out everything as archaeologists all the time, and it is very challenging. And it's important, too, that we don't make 
assumptions about other cultures, which can be really challenging when you're coming in with all the assumptions from growing up in your own culture. Yes. Another Zoom question. When you say humans exploited tree islands thousands of years ago, what exactly do you mean by exploited? Oh, that's, yeah. So when I say exploited, I mean that people are using uh, the area. Uh, they're um, using them for resources uh, and they're maybe exploiting is the wrong word, maybe using or um, using, living on them, settling on them, traveling between them, um, hunting on them. Uh, that would probably be more, more accurate. Um, I, I think we have time for one more question. Anybody here in the library with a question? Oh, how do they deal with mosquitoes? Oh my goodness, that is a, a great question. So um, you'll be pleased to know that as archeologists, we have uh, several working theories and also um, one of something that is of course important to archeologists is we also look at early historical records of people who are interacting with different groups. So we look at early Spanish accounts, accounts from people like Jonathan Dickinson and see what they're encountering. So, for the mosquitoes, one of the, um, one of the theories, one of the more practical theories about why people are building these elevated areas on mounds or middens is that at the top, you would have had more of a breeze. You would be protected from the mosquitoes that way. We also believe that people were carrying around like little um, pots and would have been burning material to create smoke that would confuse um, confuse the animals. I've also read uh, different archeological accounts so one of the questions we're trying to research as archaeologists is, are large groups of people living permanently in the Everglades or are they traveling through the Everglades? So one of the um, research questions or research theories on that is that perhaps people are using the Everglades more seasonally and then going out to places uh, like the Keys, right, to escape the mosquitoes. But that's still still an interesting topic of research. But that is an awesome question because I cannot even tell you when I go out now to the Everglades how bad it is. And even in a full bug suit, uh, it is still incredibly, it's an incredibly challenging place to work as an archeologist. And that's why we see uh, preservation bias or knowledge bias where in our coastal areas here in, um, in eastern, southeastern Florida, we have a lot of documented archaeological sites, and we don't have a lot of as many well-documented sites in the interior, in the Everglades. And of course, one of the ideas behind that is that early archaeologists and early researchers, they would kind of get to the Everglades. You know, they'd be working in like a beautiful coastal area, and they'd say, okay, we're going to like excavate all this shell mounds. And then they would get to the Everglades and be like, oh, this is miserable. I don't think anyone lived here, um, never tested, and then that's what would make it into the report. And then for like 70 years, all the archae all other archaeologists were like, well, this like early explorer said there was nothing there. So I guess there's nothing there. Um, yeah, wonderful question. So thank you so much for that. And, and Sarah, we'll finish up with a fun one from online. Okay. What is your favorite archaeological find that you've made? Oh my gosh, what is my favorite archaeological find? So I always love to talk about, so when I was, uh, when I just finished uh, graduate school, I was really fortunate to work on a project that was run by a student at um, Boston University. And one of the um, things we were documenting was this church uh, in St. George's in Bermuda, which is a very old church from the, I think it dates to like the very early um, 1600s. So it's very, very old. And uh, we were documenting the floorboards underneath the church and just kind of looking at the foundation, seeing if there was anyone, anything there. Um, and I was doing these little soil probes. And I mean, I was crawling underneath the floorboards of the church. So um, one of the reasons I was under there was because I was the smallest person who was working on this project. So they just kind of like pulled up the floorboard and they were like, get in there, Sarah. Um, and then, uh, so I'm taking these soil samples and uh, it's shallow, shallow, shallow. And then I have one that goes really deep. And I'm like, what, what is here? Um, so we decided, we made the decision that we would start excavating in that area. And then we actually found um, a skeleton there. 
So, and I'm talking like the skeleton's face is here, like my face is here. And it was, you know, I was working in a space that was like, I mean, it was like on my, like on my belly, like crawling in. Um, so when we found, uh, so when we found this skeleton, um, they were like, you know, we think this is the first governor of Bermuda. And I was like, there's no way we're going to be able to prove that. I mean, maybe, but that would be crazy if that was the case. And then as we excavated the skeleton, which we you know, had permission to do from the church, um, there was like a plaque in the rib cage that was like, here lies George Brewer, first governor of Bermuda. <laughs> and, <laughs> And then, um, and then, of course, uh, you know, they, uh, so our working theory is that they were, he died and they were going to send him back to England for a proper burial and they just never got around to it. And then this poor man had just been like underneath this church for 400 years. So after, um, after we identified that, then everyone else that was like too big to fit before suddenly and miraculously found that they were able to get into that area. And um, we um, disinterred Governor Brewer, and then uh, the church uh, buried him in the churchyard later that year. So he did finally get his burial. It wasn't back in England, but at least it was a little bit better than just in the crawl space underneath the church. So that, to this day, it remains the coolest thing I've ever found. <laughs> awesome. Well, help thank me you. give Sarah a big round of applause as a thank you. What a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Folks, thank you for coming out again tonight. I hope to see all of you. I hope to see all of you in one week for Dr. Steve Davis. He's going to teach us even more about the Everglades. And then our final lecture, believe it or not, is two weeks from tonight. We have an award-winning author and journalist, Cynthia Barnett. She's going to do a book sale before her lecture. And we're going to wrap up with another one of the Florida Humanities Council-sponsored programs. So we started with a Florida Humanities lecture. We're going to wrap up with one. And uh, that'll be it for the next year. So, folks, we'll see you again in a week. We'll see you again in two weeks. And then we'll take a, a little hiatus. Take care, everybody. Thank you.